you're going to get into this business and you're going to understand that these people are sociopaths. They're criminals. They don't look like criminals because they're dressed up in Armani suits and they have Rolex watches and drive Bentleys. But that's who you're across the table from. Welcome to a special edition episode of the Game Changing Attorney Podcast recorded live at the Evolve Summit. This episode features a conversation with Hall of Fame trial attorney and senior partner of Levin Papantonio, Mike Papantonio. You're not across the table from some person who ran into somebody's car accidentally. And you have documents that I couldn't make up if I wrote them myself. That's lawyering, gang. That's real lawyering. I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp Video, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I've built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. I sat down with Mike Papantonio to discuss the dangers of being average, why you should embrace criticism, and how being comfortable can be detrimental to your success. Being too comfortable draws you into just average, doesn't it? What ends up happening is people end up just becoming so average, they become so focused that they have burnout. That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Mike Papantonio is a legendary trial attorney, television and radio host, best-selling author, and someone who isn't afraid to speak his mind on the issues he's most passionate about. I kicked off my conversation with Mike by asking him what the catalyst was behind him taking on such ambitious endeavors. First of all, it starts with a vision. You, I'm, in, I'm in Pensacola, Florida. It's not a big city. So, you know, the idea was to build something that had a national scope. And what ends up happening so often is that... Um, that, that people look at their situation. They said, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm here. I have to dig into what I've been handed down. I don't know why that's so typical of lawyers, but one time I wrote a book uh, in, in the early days, it was, it was called In Search of Atticus Finch. I had some shrinks look at some questionnaires that we sent out to a bunch of lawyers. And the shrinks came back and I said, well, what is the biggest problem that lawyers have where it comes to being innovative, where it comes to accepting change, where it comes to doing something that Mary or Bob or Sally down the road is something different? And they said it's fear of rejection. They said lawyers and the numbers were, the, Michael, the numbers were startling. They were, it's the fear of failure. Uh, and so what they end up doing is they, you know, they get this coffee cup that's been handed down to them for generation after generation. And I always want to tell them, take that coffee cup and throw it up against the wall, crash it up against the wall and do something different. That's where mass torts came from. That's where we, when we started mass torts made perfect. The idea was we had a national reach. Let's go ahead and take advantage of that national reach and make it bigger. Some people bought in. I was seeing, I saw uh, Mark O'Mara out there. Matter of fact, when I came in and I saw Shannara. Those are two people I said, why don't you try mass torts? And they did. And it changed a lot, a lot about their practice. It's a mystery to me why we would have people who are such type A personalities that choose to put themselves in a type B world and do everything the way everybody else does it. I don't have an answer for it, but I can tell you that's the problem. And I know you say with fear of rejection, if you could speak to, you know, there's a saying that everything worthwhile is an uphill climb. And if you could talk about maybe some of the rejection you faced on the way up, it no seems way. like everything you would do, there's to be someone criticizing it. There'd be some naysayer. You ought to welcome criticism. Criticism comes out a lot of times because you're doing that thing that they don't have the courage to do, that they're not willing to take. Let me tell you a quick story. Let me shift it just a second. Years ago, I was, we put on the National Trial Lawyer Program. Keith Givens and I owned that program down in Miami, along with Mass Torch Made Perfect. But I saw you come on stage, okay? Now, I've seen a lot of vendors over the years. But you look different, Michael. You had a vision. What you were talking about connected with me because it was something that I wasn't hearing. And I mean, I'm, in, I'm sitting here in the studio, what, six years later? And this is what you were talking about. 
So it has to begin with that notion of, I want to do something dramatically different. You've done it. You're exhibit A where it comes to vendors. And truthfully, everybody on these camera, everybody watching this right now, I tell them, reach out, do something that raises your vision, man. Everybody's doing way on 1-800-CRASH. Everybody's doing comp. Everybody's doing the same thing. And we have this license to be so creative. We have this license to change culture. When we started the tobacco litigation, Pensacola, Florida, I mean, think about that. Opioids started in Pensacola, Florida. 48 of the biggest pharmaceutical cases in the country started in Pensacola, Florida. Eight of the largest environmental cases, Pensacola, Florida. But it starts with that, it starts with that, what do I want to be when I grow up? You know, uh, you know, your best, you know, the best color you can wear is plaid. That should be your favorite color. <laughs> Plan. And that, what I mean by that is there's many different parts of being a lawyer. So use that license. Jump, come out to Mass Towards Made Perfect. You had, you had it right. You know, there'll be 2,000 people in a room, and I'll talk about, let me use an example. Roundup. You were out there when we were talking about Roundup. I said, go get these cases. They're important cases. Maybe after I did that, maybe 10 lawyers in 2000 got real serious and went after them. The opioid case, right? You were out there when that big fight was taking place. Pap, you know, Pap Antonio, you can't do this. You can't, you can't represent counties and cities and sue the distributors. And the people who said, that's a pretty good idea. Was there $26 billion on the state, on, on the table right now, just for one part of that case? So it's just a matter of saying, why am I stuck in this merry-go-round? You got out of the merry-go-round. You see, you could have done the same thing everybody else did, but you didn't. So you looking back at that at that national trial lawyers. So I knew we had to get attention somehow. I wanted to get your attention. Oh, you got my attention, like, brother. We were giving away that that Tesla Model X, and it was hundred thousand dollars. To me, then I mean, I'm telling you, it may have been about ten million dollars. And the interesting thing, and we were giving this car away at national trial lawyers. We couldn't even like. So I put all the money into the car to get your attention. We couldn't even stay at the Lowe's. I couldn't afford to stay at the Lowe's. We stayed at another hotel. You know, we gave the car away. But like years later, what is that? Drill down on that. It's courage. It's your ability to abandon fearfulness and say, why can Pap Antonio go up the Ohio River Valley and try a case that makes a billion dollars? Why can Pap Antonio do the tobacco case? And I can't. You just have to change your thinking. Everybody watching this right now, maybe there'll be a handful of them that'll say, I, I, I get it. Let me raise my vision. Let me look at something bigger than auto cases. I'm not down on auto cases. God bless you. Somebody's got to do that. But what if you're cleaning up an entire ecosystem where you're saving 70,000 people from getting cancer? What if you're pulling a product off the market that's killing thousands of people because the bunch of sociopaths running that corporation could not care less? that they're killing people because they're making, they're making so much money. I, t I just took the, the deposition of the general counsel for 3M. Now, I'm going to give you one more tip. Some of y'all going to do it, some of you won't. 3M, the PFAS case, if you live in an area where they have water districts, you know, drinking water districts, go get that case because probably that water district is contaminated with PFAS. After the depositions we've taken in this case, I couldn't make the documents up. I couldn't create them for myself. So some of you are going to go, you're going to make a call and say, I think I know somebody who's on county commissioner, I want, I want the water district. And you're going to make 30 to $50 million on one case. That's what's, what, that's what's going to bring in. You're not going to make that, but you're going to make whatever kind of contract you have. So, see, I love that you're doing this because in Mass Torts Made Perfect, what we have there is Mass Torts lawyers. They're already people who are making a lot of money. You got Shannara there. You got Omera there. You got, got, you got people that have said, I think I can make this transition. And they make the transition and it, you know, changes their life. I want to dig in that because I'm sure there's people thinking, that sounds great when it works, when the payoff is there. But Mike, what if, you know, what if I invest all these dollars? What if I do this and it doesn't okay, work Okay, here out, it right? is, here it is. I have a program right now, please write this down. It's called Face to Face. Go to MTMP, program is called Face to Face. 
If you have a question about a project that you want to know about, give me a call. We'll spend 15 minutes on Zoom, and I'll tell you, this is the one that's good. This is the one that's bad. And what my job is, and my, my law firm's job is, A, we're trial lawyers. We actually visualize these cases as going to trial. That's different in this business, believe it or not. There's a lot of people that do this, but there's only a handful of us that actually try the cases. So we look at it, how is it going to try? What are the documents going to look like? Who are the people involved? So we analyze it the same way we analyze a stock, uh, that a broker might analyze a stock. So when you call, please do, face to face, I'll be glad to talk to you. I'll tell you, you know, you might want to jump into Mesh, but here's the problems. You might, might want to jump into Val Sarton. You might want to jump into Paraquat, but here are the problems. Let me talk about your practice and how you can do that. I saw, like, a couple months back, they were giving away dinner on Mike Papantonio's yacht. So my question to you is, why are you still doing this? Well, I like doing it. There, look... You know that chart you had? You, it was a startling chart. You just showed it. It was, what, a million, two hundred thousand lawyers or something like that? Out of a million, two hundred thousand lawyers, there are only this many trial lawyers left because everybody wants to arbitrate. Everybody wants to settle. The corporations that you're going to be dealing with, if you choose, come to Mass Torch Made Perfect. When is it? October? It's, in, it's October. in October. I don't know the exact date. It's out in Las Vegas. It's at the Bellagio. We've been doing it two times a year at either the Wynn Hotel or the Bellagio Hotel. Incredible turnout. But we talk about issues that I think are going to matter to you. Hey, the kind of case we're talking about, the difference between a typical auto case and the kind of case I'm talking about. Young lawyer, I was, I was about your age. And a case comes in where this, this company has, they're making something called Factor 8. Factor 8 was something that you would use, a hemophiliac would use to stop bleeding, right? So they said, uh, I had been trying asbestos cases, and so for some reason I was asked, get involved with that case, go try it. So the company knew that the Factor 8 product was contaminated with HIV. They knew it. We got them to pull it off the market in the United States, and you know what they did? They sold it all over the world. They sent it to Asia, and people died of AIDS. They sent it to South America, and people died of AIDS. So you ask yourself, doesn't that case matter? Isn't that something that really matters to you? You know, you chose to go to law school for certain reasons. Use that ticket for cases like that. You know, nobody in that case went to prison. Nobody. In the U.S., they did in France. But see, that's the problem. That's what you're going to be running into. You're going to get into this business, and you're going to understand that these people are sociopaths. They're criminals. They don't look like criminals because they're dressed up in Armani suits, and they have Rolex watches and drive Bentleys. But that's who you're across the table from. You're not across the table from some person who ran into somebody's car accidentally. And you have documents that I couldn't make up if I wrote them myself. That's lawyering, gang. That's real lawyering. So let me ask you this. When I spoke with Robert Bellot, we had him on the podcast, amazing book. Mark Ruffalo plays him in the movie Dark Waters. <laughs> yeah. There's a part in the book when this litigation's really starting to scale, and he said, I had to bring in Pap. Like at this point, like I really needed Pap. What is it that you do differently? I'm very specific. If you'll go on to, I think it's trial school college, you'll see something that's called an attack deposition. Many of y'all know Ron Motley. Before he died, he handled asbestos cases out of South Carolina. And I was a young lawyer. I was able to work with Ron and develop this notion of an attack deposition. And it's so unique. Again, there's only a handful of us that do it. Go watch one you'll probably want to say, that's the kind of depot I want to take. I get hired for that. I get hired to try cases, as I did for Rob Ballot, who, by the way, is a brilliant, brilliant lawyer. Nobody would pay attention to him. And so we finally did and said, let's go try these cases. And a billion dollars later, it worked out. I'd love if you could speak to, just so people see really what it takes, what have been some of the biggest mistakes you've made? Whether it's cases you've lost, branding mistakes, just what, what does it look like when Mike Papantonio loses? Well, cases I've lost are ones that I thought I would never lose. It always came down to uh, came down to hubris most of the time. You know, you get on a run and you're winning cases and you think you're bulletproof <laughs> and you're not. And so, you, you know, you kind of go in with that element of hubris. 
where it comes to projects, there are projects I wish I had done for the right reason. And I came full circle on that. Right now, many of y'all may know that the human trafficking litigation, we started that up in Ohio. And I wish I had done that the first time it came to me because I feel like I could have saved a lot of people. But now we're hot on their trail. We got Wall Street involved. Uh, Wall Street's the money behind a lot of it. The big hotels are the big money behind it. And we're going to spank them really bad. We're going to punish them. And I wish I had done that earlier. I know you've said in the past, you've said this a lot, that being too comfortable is a very dangerous thing. Well, first of all, being too comfortable, it draws you into just average, doesn't it? I wrote a book one time, it was called Resurrecting Aesop. It was a motivational book for lawyers. And in there, what I was trying to explore is what happens when you become too comfortable. When a lawyer does, and I had called on the shrinks again, you know, did a questionnaire, shrinks, what do you think? And they surprised me again. They said the biggest problem lawyers have with burnout, the reason they end up with drug problems and alcohol problems and five marriages and kids that, you know, they can't control is because their life isn't all that balanced. And the reason it's not balanced is because they're doing the same thing the same way every single day. Doesn't that sound like a gulag? And so what ends up happening is people end up just becoming so average. They become so focused that they have burnout. It's the one cause of burnout. So I'm, I'm urging you, try what I'm asking. Just take one step. Try one case with me. Take one project with me. I, I see Madeline Penley right there. She's with my office. Madeline has been out of school for two years. We have her taken the key depositions in some of the biggest cases in America. Why do we do that? Because I believe she has the same ability that a lawyer, an older lawyer has if she focuses on it. So anybody who wants to jump in with me, please do. Come out to Vegas, call me, Zoom me on face to face. I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, it will change the way you practice law. And outside of these, let's say cases and litigations on the note of you know, being uncomfortable, what, what keeps you up at night right now? Right now, I'm, let me do full circle. What right now keeps me up is this. Most corporations that we deal with are, have sociopaths on the other side of the table when I'm taking a deposition. You can't compromise with a sociopath. Okay, you can't. So if you can't compromise with them, what do you have to do? You have to take them to trial. You have to punish them. Otherwise, what ends up happening? It perpetuates itself, right? NBA school, Joe's an NBA school, right? He hears about Uncle Todd, Uncle Todd, who pulled it off. He pulled it off. He came up with a product, kept it on the market, a pharmaceutical. He lied to the regulators. He passed money around to politicians. He, he captured the media. And before you knew it, he sold a gazillion of these drugs. And yes, it did kill a thousand people, but Uncle Todd made $80 million in the process for himself on his exit from the company. Keeps me up at night that there aren't enough trial lawyers that'll walk into a courtroom and, and go after these sociopaths. It scares the hell out of me if you want to know the truth. Compromise doesn't do it. And let me ask you honestly, because I remember talking with Robert Bellot, and there was a point in that litigation where they had to wait for years to even get the study back, and like the people they were representing, they're dying. Like they, they yeah. just can't wait around long enough. And I asked him, because he's going years, it's wearing on his family, it's wearing on his kids. Oh, God. Like, he was with a, one of the most prestigious defense firms in Ohio, almost lost his job. His wife thought he'd gone batshit crazy. I mean, you know, this whole life was falling apart. But he hung in there. And, and matter of fact, Part of the story, I think it's in the book that he wrote about, is when he came to me, I said, Robert, you don't have a case put together. You haven't taken any meaningful depositions. So what did he do? He went, got back on the horse. He rebuilt the case. Now PFAS may be, matter of fact, last week we potentially, and I think we will get hired to handle the PFAS case in Brussels, and we'll handle it in Europe. And that's another thing. Here you're sitting here, God, I'm looking at all of you folks. I mean, you're millennials and younger. You got a whole career ahead of you. By the time your career's over, you're going to be practicing law in Europe. Globalism is going to pull you right into all that. So go ahead and get started now. Look ahead. Do it now, though, you, when you can do it. Don't get caught into a practice where you... Look, <laughs> forgive me if they're defense lawyers out there, all right? But defense lawyers have a certain mentality. They come out of school. They're top of their class. 
you know, their law review and they're just, you know, they, they got all the right stuff for a corporate defense firm that's want, that wants to put them in a cubicle like a damn veal, okay? They're in a cubicle. And they stay in that cubicle for 15 years. They never distinguish themselves. They never do anything that moves the dial ahead for consumers. Their victory is when they come back to the office and say, hey, I wrote an opinion that kept this family from recovering when mama was killed by, by bad drug. Why does a person do that? Why does a person say, I'm better suited for a defense firm? You know why? It comes back to rejection. They get out of school, the defense firm takes them to the country club and everybody's patting Bill, who's been around for 50 years and he's the, the, the premier defense firm head lawyer. And they get sucked into that, like that matters. Who cares? Who cares? You gotta have iconoclast. I've heard you use terms like that. You gotta be an iconoclast, right? That's what you are. It's a big, big word. It's a big <laughs> word. It's a big word and it's a big requirement. But that's the difference between a defense firm, a defense lawyer, and a plaintiff's lawyer. Now, let me take it one step further. If you are that person and you know that you're a plaintiff's lawyer, right? You've chosen to be different from that defense lawyer, so why be average? Go ahead and take the next step. Rather than trapping yourself, you are a type A personality forcing yourself into a type B world, and it doesn't work. It makes you miserable. So I'm curious, like, you know, when someone's on the way up, let's say in their career, they don't have much to lose. You can understand that, you know, that drive, if you will, because they're trying to make something of themselves. They're trying to build their brand. They're trying to build their practice. But what happens when you, you get to a point where you don't need this anymore? And this is what I wanted to ask you, because I remember talking to Robert about this. You get to a point where, like, you're dealing with against a corporation that's got billions of dollars of resources. You're putting in all this time and energy, making all these sacrifices, like missing out on time with your family. You know, just there's trade offs and compromises everywhere. And do you ever think to yourself, do I really need this, right? Let me tell you something. I've never made a compromise with my family. Never. And I never would. You can do both. We got ways to get it done, there's ways to do both. So I don't buy into that idea. Burnout is not the same thing as I don't have time for my family. Burnout is I'm doing this thing that I have learned to hate over 20 years. I'm tired of seeing you know these ads where cars are falling out of the damn sky on people's heads, and you know I'm, that's the best I can do is do a comp case or a. Everybody watching this has more ability. Again, I'm not down on it. The auto practice is, is critical. Somebody has to do that, but you can do both. So here's what I say. Here's what I said to O'Mara or, or, you know, any of these folks out there that I, I saw, I was sitting in the other room with them. I said, make it part of your practice. You don't have to jump in with both feet. Make it part of your practice. Take 80% and devote it to your auto practice. Take 20% and say, this is, this is my growth money. 20% is my growth money. And invest into things with projects that if you'll call me, I'll tell you about. If you'll show up in MTMP, you'll see it firsthand. He's going to be at MTMP. You're going to hear, you're not going to give that same speech, are you? <laughs> you got so many speeches. But he's going to entertain you at MTMP in October. So come on out. Let me, let me talk to you about all this stuff. So you said something interesting. I, I bet people are wondering this right now. You said you don't have to make that trade off. So if you could speak to that, like how did, how did you do it? You know, just on the way up, if someone okay. wants to get there as quickly okay, as possible. Okay, here it is. Here it is. I used to windsurf competitively. Fairly, I wasn't very good, but I thought of myself as being competitive. And I went, <laughs> I went down to Pensacola. I didn't have a job. And I thought I'd bartend at night and windsurf. And what I was really doing, and I had plenty of job offers out of school because of the trial program, and they needed trial lawyers from L.A. to New York. What I was trying to, to do was, first of all, focus, where do I want to live? I wanted to talk about my quality of life first, right? And then I want to build all the other parts around that quality of life. So I've never lost that sense. You know, I may be in trial for two months at a time, but for a month, I'm gonna be gone. I'm gonna be diving and out on a boat and whatever stuff I do. So, it, and I'm, it's gonna include my family. I mean, if you don't have balance in your family, it's, it's dangerous. So Mark Lanier, dear friend of mine, he sends me a, it's called a Mark's Thought of the Day. And what it is, it's a wholesale rejection of what I call 
you know, they used to be called cowboy lawyers. Who had the biggest plane? Who had the fastest boat? I mean, you know, it was an ugly time. Who had the biggest verdict? My partner, Fred Levin, I love him to death. He recently passed away, and he grew up in that era, right? But Mark and people like myself and a lot of people that do this very seriously say that it's not workable. The cowboy era is gone. It doesn't work anymore. You ask me about, you know, how do I do both? You have to be committed to it. And I don't think my daughter, I don't know if she's watching right now. I can't see if she is. But if she's watching, I don't think she'd ever tell you that I didn't spend enough time. You know? With the kids, it's, it's a, in your case, like, you can spend more time with them if you take them to work with you, right? Yeah, my Sarah's working with me now. She's a lawyer, and my gosh, what a talent. She graduated about the same time Maddie Penley. That whole era from Stetson, just great trial lawyers. And it's interesting to me, like you mentioned Mark Lanier and yourself and kind of getting out of this cowboy era, but at the same time, so I know Mark is very family focused and yet you're still seeing that success as a byproduct. He's got the billion dollar verdicts, right? Of course. So it's it, still it, happening. You can do, he's done both. Yeah. He's a preacher. I mean, he's got a church built in his backyard. I mean, come on. So, okay. So what is that? That's a commitment to who he is, right? And then all these other things are just built around that commitment. And that's what I think you'll find, uh, whether you're talking about Michael Watts or some of these other folks that, you know, that try a lot of cases and get big verdicts. Every one of them have that quality. So if someone's watching this right now and they love the idea of being this incredible trial lawyer, they want to build this brand, but they're not there yet. Like they're, they're looking at you and saying, I want to get to where Mike Papantonio is. Where do they start? They start by taking the first step. I'm not trying to sell mass towards made perfect. I really am not. I'm not trying to sell face to face. There is no cost to it. I'm trying to say, you got to make the first step. And after the first step, it becomes a habit. And then you want to know more about, okay, well, what's the next step I take in a mass tort? How do I get the mass tort cases? I have an X uh, limited budget. How do I do that? What cases should I be taking? How do I get on an MDL or a PSC? that runs, you know, these things. I hope there's lawyers watching right now that we've done exactly that for, where we've, we've taken them from the idea of wanting to do it to where they're making, they're adding five, six, seven million dollars a year to their practice. You mentor a number of trial lawyers. What in, in your experience have you seen are some of the biggest mistakes that they make, that they're things that you're helping to coach them with? Well, the biggest thing is the commitment. I tell my young lawyers, I said, if you can't walk into a room and have a thousand people around you and every one of them disagrees with you, everybody thinks you, you know, you're, what you're saying is ridiculous, it's nonsense, and still feel good, and you know you're on the right side, and still feel good, I'm fine with these people shouting at me. You talked about it over here, didn't you, when you just gave that speech? You said people were critical of you. And what you were trying to do is accomplish. You had a goal. You had a mission. And if you can't play that mission out, then you're never going to be a real trial lawyer. It's got, it's got to be real, man. You've got to have a real commitment to wanting to help consumers. And right now, I've, I'm so entangled with my commitment on human trafficking. A new book comes out. It's uh, supposed to be released next month, I think. It's called Inhuman Trafficking. And all these books I write are, are based on cases that we've handled. You'll like this book a lot. But as I was writing it, I more and more sold myself on the idea of how much this matters. So I have to do that every day. I have to remind myself what I do matters. You know, as the saying goes, you'll never be criticized by anyone doing more than you, right? I want to talk about the books, though. The, so these books, these legal thrillers, I remember seeing these, like Law and Addiction and so on. Like, I want to talk about your process when you do this, because I've heard you go off, and I don't know if you go off into the woods or a cabin, but you are <laughs> off the grid, and then you come back with a book. <laughs> I am off the grid for a while. Well, okay, so they're easy to write because they're all based on real events. For example, one of them's based on uh, the Yaz case. Uh, it's, it's $48 million verdict in South Texas. And that was, a, that was a, a product that was killing women. It was a birth control pill. And so around that actual event comes a pretty good mystery about a, a bunch of excitement. The second book was built around a whistleblower case. The guy comes in and he's got a, uh, he says they're manufacturing a gun sight, goes on pistol and a rifle that is defective and it's killing people. 
So we handled that case, and the second book is built around that. Third case built around the opioid case, right? It's called Law and Addiction. So all of it's pretty easy to do because you kind of go to court that day, right? And you come home, <laughs> you make some notes, you create some characters. I love this last one. I really do. I've created some great new characters in this last one called Inhuman Trafficking, distributed by Skyhorse, Simon Schuster. That'll be out in about a month. I want to talk about kind of the, the reason why you write these books, because because of the economics, I think, of these major litigations and the price they put on a human life, you know, they'll settle, they'll spend money. But it, it seems like the, the reason for the documentaries, the books is just raising awareness by the general public. Like, you've got to really get it out there because it takes a lot to take down these billion dollar companies. Yeah, well, you know, uh, Morris Dees has been a friend a lot of years to me. He wrote the foreword on the first book I wrote, In Search of Atticus Finch. He was one of these people that were marching in the streets. People were throwing rocks at him, turning hoses on him, having dogs sicked on him. So he walked the walk. And I said to him one time, uh, I said, Morris, what is it that changed the whole cycle of civil rights in the country? And he said, well, you'd like to think it's one event. You'd like to think it's Rosa Parks sitting on the back of the bus. You'd like to think it's three men that are sitting at a, having food served at a diner. You might think it's just this march or that march. He says, it's all that. It's all those things that culminate. And all of a sudden, what you create is this major leap. It's a major cultural leap. And I have always lived by that. Documentary here, book here, speech here, TV show here, whatever it is, whatever it is. You're talking about branding. That's my brand. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. Everything, everything comes into who is that guy? Who is that person? And all that centers around my effort to try to get the message out on any one of those projects. What was that moment or was there a certain point where you, you felt that, okay, now I am, I'm an, I am this thought leader? Was it after a certain case? Was it after a certain number of initiatives? What was that critical point where you're like, okay, now I go from not being known to being known? I'm going to mess with you a little bit. When did it hit you? It still hasn't hit me. I don't. Uh, oh, come on. It's hit you. No, it's, no. I, listen, I'll, I'll be honest with you on this. So I learned it, something like when you look at two types of people, there are the ones that, let's say the ones that aren't as driven, the ones that aren't as hungry, whatever it is, they sometimes always feel like they're doing too much. But if you look at the most committed, I, what I found in my experience is they constantly feel like they're not doing enough. Constantly. <laughs> You'll always feel like you're not doing yeah. enough. And matter of fact, here's the way I look at some of these projects. I'll get a product off the market. I'll clean up an ecosystem. And in back of my mind, I know it's just going to happen again. There's always going to be another sociopath or psychopath who's dressed up in a suit, got an MBA from Yale that just plays by different rules. There's always going to be that person who looks like that, even though we throw a, a kid in jail who's wearing a hoodie selling marijuana on the street corner. There's always going to be that dichotomy. And there's always going to be that cultural acceptance of that. But I say to myself, I can't change that infinitum, but I can change it while I'm kicking around, right? I hope I can train some of these younger lawyers that work with me, they're excellent lawyers, to carry that on. To say, yeah, we're going to pick up there. You know, that's my hope. Well, let's talk about that, actually, because you've gotten to a point where you're thinking about not just the legacy, but the secession planning. How do we keep this, this movement going? How do we continue to make mm. this impact even when you see transitions within the firm and with, with, with Fred Levin and so on? Like, you want to maintain that impact. What, if you can elaborate on that. Yeah, well, first of all, it has to be part of the culture in your firm. Mm. You have to believe so much in your young lawyers. They have to give you reason to believe. But you have to say, Maddie, I'm going to throw you into the biggest Zantac depot in America right now. And it's going to make Maddie work because she cares. And she's going, to, she's going to do what has to be done. You have to, first of all, believe in that person. Right now, they're interviewing LaRuby May, who's one of our lawyers in Washington, D.C., African-American. Brilliant, brilliant young lawyer has done more in the area of civil rights than any young lawyer I've ever known. So what I'm trying to do now is transition her and have her doing what the firm does as far as changing consumer issues in this country, getting engaged in social issues by way of mass torts. You think about every mass tort, the basic is a social issue. I remember a judge just, just a couple of years ago, I made the mistake of saying something awful about 
<laughs> some folks. That never happens, right? That never happens. But they were the people that made decisions in the opioid case, and he brought me in, and he probably handled it right. He spanked me a little bit, and that was okay. But the point being is that has to be who you are, right? It has to be who you are. It's got to be, you don't even think about it. It's just second nature. So as we look to the future, I want, I want to get your thoughts on, you're starting to see this, this idea of non-lawyer firm ownership in Arizona, oh. Utah, it'll spread. What, like, looking ahead for the, for the law firm owners that are watching this right now, what, what is your prediction for where this will go? Okay, I think, it's, I think right now we're already seeing the edge of something that could be disastrous. We had a case a couple years ago where the lawyer that had gotten money from some money loaning company couldn't settle his cases because he owed the company too much money. So what we have is these Wall Street freaks, these Wall Street freaks who, oh, by the way, that I'm suing in something as ugly as, as human trafficking. Those people are in our office telling us how we're going to run our practice. I mean, that's ugly, man. These people have, they got $3 trillion out there. They, they, they don't know what to do with it. So they think, well, we're going we're gonna to call these folks and show up with a big check and everything's going to be okay. And then they're going to tell these folks how they can practice law. It's not just the loan. Don't you, they're buying equity interests. When the person taking that loan can't pay it back, they convert it to an equity interest. What's going on out there is just the first step to all of us losing our autonomy. And to these freaks on Wall Street, who I despise because the bottom of almost every case I handle, there's some Wall Street freak making a decision that's killing people, stealing money from mom and pop pension programs, making decisions to, it, to destroy entire ecosystems. I mean, that's, that's who we're doing business with, man. And I agree with you 100%, Mike. You're, you're teeing me up well because tomorrow, this is what we're spending the entire day on, on how to, how to fight back against this stuff. What, what are your thoughts, though? I, I found a way to sue them, and I'm suing them, yeah. okay? We'll talk more next time we get together. <laughs> I'll tell you how it goes. <laughs> but I'm suing them. And I, I can't wait to be across the table from them, man. You know, can't wait. These people don't invent anything. They don't make anything. They don't help anybody. They just want to give you money and then come to you and say, hey, you owe me, uh, what is it, 25% or something stupid that people are paying? You don't need to do that. Don't do it. Don't do it. So, Mike, as we close this out, I'm sure like, you know, you've gotten a lot of advice along the way on what you should or shouldn't do. What's, what's been the best advice you've ever received? What's been the worst advice you've ever received? Best advice I ever got was go to trial, Mike, go to trial, Mike, go to trial, Mike. Worst advice, I guess... I don't think I've ever had any bad advice. Come on. I get bad advice all the time. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know that I have. I can't think of it if I have. Whatever advice I took, I either, if I thought it was bad advice, I'd throw it out the window. Has, has anyone ever told you, Nate, Mike, don't do that? <laughs> oh, yeah. I've had don't do that. Don't Boy, say that? Don't, oh, come on, man. Yeah. You know that. I'm on TV every week on some international show called America's Lawyer where I used to do MSNBC, and almost every, every time I appeared, they said, I can't say that, I can't do that, because you're going to offend our advertiser. So I went to Russian television and started doing America's Lawyer. And I'm sure you had critics and naysayers oh, saying, Mike, don't do that. Yeah, they think, good call for the me brand. Bolsh you know, Bolshevik, and I don't care. Come on. Well, there you go. So if someone could take away one thing from everything that we've talked about, besides you know, sign up for MTMP, what, what would it be? Call me on Facebook. Zoom me on Facebook. I want to meet as many of you as I can. I'll take as much time as it takes. We'll have 15, 20 minutes. I'll spend as much time as you want. I want to give a huge thank you to Mike Papantonio for taking the time to speak with us at the Evolve Summit. You know, what particularly resonated with me was when Mike said that being too comfortable draws you into average. And that if you want to achieve significant goals, you need to get comfortable being uncomfortable. You've been listening to the Game Changing Attorney Podcast with me, Michael Mogul. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you could share the podcast with at least one other ambitious law firm owner who you believe would benefit. And you know what? Maybe more than one. For more information on our fireside chat with Mike Papantonio, see the show notes for this episode in your podcast app or visit GameChangingAttorney.com. And join us next time and we'll be speaking with one of the country's leading trial attorneys who has amassed not millions, but billions of dollars of jury verdicts, the one and only Brian Panish. You know, whether you're really rich or really poor, if you really have that desire, it doesn't matter. It's all about the passion. And when you're trying cases, 
The jurors know, they can see it. When you believe it and you're asking for a lot of money and they can see you believe it, they got a lot better chance to get there. That's next time on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast.